hear some more about later, but don't come. No worries. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening. Another late night. I'm sorry, it's been a busy, busy, busy meeting, and we're trying to trying to get it all in. We're trying to make the time worthwhile here. So um, again, I'm Deanna Walker, uh, manager of membership and public services. Um, we have had a couple of developed workshops, and I know this one will discussion. It will follow right along because they have some great things to tell you about some phenomenal programs that they My slide next. Okay. All right. Good evening. I'm Ashley Edwards. Um, I am an animal science professor at Louisiana Tech University. And um, I always joke, I think anywhere in ag, we're kind of shifted over to some other part of campus because nobody ever wants to smell us. Um, so <laughs> we are located on what we call South Campus as opposed to Main Campus there in Ruston. And um, Actually, what got me involved in Sigma Xi was our brown bag luncheons, and so I was excited when you asked me to kind of talk about it. Um, so Louisiana Tech itself is it's small, at least to me anyways, and um, we do have five major colleges, and they're all pretty diverse. So I'm in College of Applied Natural Sciences, um, which also has like fashion design and merchandising. And so I'm playing with my sheep every day, and I'm like, well, here's some wool. You know, I don't, I don't know how to, how to do that. So with all of that, the diversity even within the college and then throughout the university itself, what Sigma Xi was looking to do when they started doing these luncheons was a way to increase networking and collaboration. Um, so I came from Texas A&M University when I, where I did my graduate program and came to Louisiana Tech and I was given a lab space. It's um, part of a duplex and I had no pipetters, no anything. You know, they were like, so there's 20 sheep and 50 cows, kind of do whatever you want. So I started out with almost nothing and I was able to meet people through things like these luncheons, um, our science cafes and things like that as well, and be able to kind of reach out. So with that, one big thing is introducing our new faculty members. And so I just threw some, some pictures here, but uh, we have engineer um, on the left, a biologist in the middle, and then a forester on the right. So biology and forestry kind of go hand in hand, but then we also have somebody coming in and doing some talks about NASA. So it is a way to reach out and to meet with people. Um, you know, I found out about some PCR equipment and things like that that I could do with my fetal programming work in and collaborate with. So um, just really, really a way to, um, to get new faculty kind of adjusted. At least I can say personally, I really enjoyed that. And so um, it's easy to put these luncheons on. We're quarter-based um, university, so we have 10-week quarters. Um, which kind of is good and it's bad. Um, it's bad because we're trying to cram a lot into 10 weeks. Teaching, research, and then any kind of service event. But it's also good because we're able to set goals. So we try to have a brown bag luncheon. We try to have a science cafe. At least those two things once a quarter. Plus we do the distinguished lectureship um, series in, in the spring as well. And so we use maybe two people. Um, typically our president will be one of the people on this committee and then if not another officer, some one other Sigma Xi member will join in. First reach out to the new faculty and then reach out to anybody that's doing anything kind of interesting. We've had a few new um, centers be developed on campus and so it's pretty easy to fill you know, three spots in a year. Um, we've tried to have more than that, but it typically doesn't work. Occasionally we'll throw in like a pizza lunch or something like that, but it won't be actually the brown bag luncheon. Um, easy advertisement through the university. We actually kept saying that we were going to put together some kind of social media page, but we haven't yet. We've just been able to do flyers and talk to people and mention it at our own faculty meetings um, for each different department. 
I mentioned the new uh, recruitment for faculty, but we also utilize it for graduate students as well. Uh, at Tech, we just have a small graduate program, but as they start to prepare either their theses or their dissertation, we do invite them to actually come in and present at these brown bag luncheons. And the best part of it is it's cost free because people bring their South Campus on the main campus and vice versa and we can kind of highlight all of that because even though we are very small we kind of hide in our own little holes so from the Sigma Xi aspect um, it really is very very easy to um, to implement and I would say that most of the time those new faculty members at least I can say I did signed up for Sigma Xi and so it's an awesome way to recruit the new faculty to bring them in and then also those graduate students as well so the last slide, really I just kind of threw in, it's hard to read, I know, I didn't know if we were going to provide the slides for everybody, but it just kind of shows you the diversity um, of the programs and the talks that we've had over the last year or two. So, y'all wait for questions or? Okay, I talk very quickly, so. Oh, yes, I was so excited. Um, so we were the chapter of excellence this year for Sigma Xi. Uh, we were very honored for that because they, the national office approached us and said, do you want to be nominated for an award? So yes, <laughs> that would be great. Um, so yes, they were very, very thrilled and thank you all um, for that. But we really, really appreciate it. And I guess the quarter system does kind of pay off because I thought it was hectic to cram that much stuff in. But we are, like I said, able to, to implement one thing per quarter, uh, one brown bag lunch and one science cafe and those sorts of things. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Doug Jardine and uh, I'm a past president of the Kansas State University chapter and interesting enough I probably do less research than anybody else at this conference. I only have a 10% research appointment. My appointment at the university is 90% extension but what that means is I have to understand everybody else's research and be able to synthesize and interpret it to take it out to the producers of Kansas that I serve. I'm a plant pathologist, by the way, so I do diseases of plants. Um, and I was initiated as a graduate student at the Michigan State chapter. And uh, you know, when I moved to Kansas State to get my job, qualifications committee. I'm, yeah, sure. And then next thing I knew, I was president. And, and um, I am currently the webmaster for the, the chapter, so I'm not actually, but I, I maintain the web pages. Uh, so we um, actually do uh, a number of different things. So this just gives you an overview of all the different programs that we really have. Um, I'll, I'll mention just a little bit more our K-State uh, Sigma Xi Distinguished Lecture Series. I will tell you that the biggest crowd we have ever had was for Dr. Greg Forbes, the tornado and severe weather expert, because everybody knew him from TV. And so they were really excited. Um, in 2008, we had a tornado went directly through campus. It actually totaled my car out. Uh, that I, had, I was at a meeting in Iowa and left my car on, in a parking lot in campus and it was gone. Um, and so uh, there was a large number of trees. Uh, this, you, you can't tell, but this is right just outside the College of Agriculture's Dean's office and building. And so they had this uh, uh, artisan who does welding kinds of things make this tornado monument. And, and actually, Dr. Forbes was very excited about having his picture taken with it. He even asked me to mail it to him. Um, and and uh, we also um, uh, award uh, Outstanding High School Science Teacher Awards. Um, we have uh, our Outstanding K-State Scientist Award. Uh, for itself. So um, even if we don't have any national
Coffee House down in Aggieville. Aggieville is the student section uh, of, of the town. It's immediately adjacent to the campus. Uh, it's co-sponsored by the Kansas Citizens for Science. Um, and, and this is just some of the titles of some of our more um, recent uh, talks. Most of the speakers are faculty members. Occasionally there's some graduate students and occasionally we will bring in uh, somebody from the community. So for instance, we had um, uh, for a while, well it's since gone out of business due to bad management, but we had a large scale brewery in town. They were brewing 60,000 barrels a year. And uh, the owner of that came down and talked about the science of beer for, for a talk. Um, and you can see some of them are, are kind of science related, let's pick one out there, Hacking Life with Christopher Jean Dries. But then we also had, uh, back in 2018, it's the centenary of the Spanish flu. What does it mean to you? And so that was kind of a historical topic. Um, there is also a second uh, series in town called Science on Tap, which is at the microbrewery in town. That is co-sponsored by uh, the uh, Manhattan Sunset Zoo because they have a science communications intern program. And it's the interns that usually come down and speak. Uh, but we, we try and cooperate and, and cross-advertise each other's programs. They run on separate weeks of, and separate days, so there, there's really not a, a conflict. Um, but since they've started running the Science on Tap programs, I think we see a little bit larger audience at ours. And, and it varies, but you know, 20 people would be a good number for us on, at the coffee house on a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. But uh, the size of the crowds fluctuate with, um, with the speaker. A lot of times the speakers bring their own audience with them. They, all their graduate students have to show up or their undergraduate student workers or whatever. Uh, but we've been doing this uh, for many, many years and it's, it's been uh, a really successful for us. <clears throat> and then uh, Deanna mentioned uh, that we should maybe mention the, the Distinguished Lecture Program. So the very first one was in 2012. Um, we invited a gentleman from Texas A&M University, Ted Goble, from the Department of Anthropology, and you can see he was talking about uh, the search for origins of the first Americans and how, did they actually cross on, the, on a land bridge over the Bering Straits. At that time, um, it was an evening banquet, and so we would have the, the meal, we'd give out awards, and we had the speaker. But what we had noticed over a few years' time is that once people went home from campus, they really didn't want to come back. And we were down to maybe 25 people max. And so we you know, decided, well, let's do something different. And so in 2013, uh, uh, when I became president, I said, let's just scrap the banquet and we'll have a, uh, a reception uh, in, uh, for the distinguished lecture um, that's coming in. Uh, we will have students bring their posters so people have something to look at. We will provide uh, I, I think the year I was at, we, we got ice cream from the campus's ice cream. Uh, we make our own ice cream on campus uh, because we're a land-grant college and we can. Um, and, um, and then we presented our various awards for our outstanding scientist, our high school science teacher, um, recognized our GAR winners. And we also, the, the high school teachers got to go to dinner with the distinguished lecturer. And so that gave them a chance to interact with some pretty famous scientists. Um, you'll note there's a couple there in 2014, 2015, Dr. Jim Van Etten, who happens to be a plant pathologist, so I actually knew Jim and invited him down from Lincoln because it's only a two hour drive. Uh, but he's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, as was the next year, Dr. J uh, John Hildebrand from the University of Arizona. And the National Academy members tend to draw a little larger audiences. Um, uh, but, you know, the way we do it, um, is the board will go through the list of the people who've been vetted and are up on the website and we'll pick three people that we would be interested in um, and we submit our nominations and then we look to see the commonalities um, and uh, so we use that. The other thing we look at is what is their area of specialty and what departments on campus would be interested in co-sponsoring uh, these people and um, so um, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Sadek there in 2016, she was talking about nanosensors for rapid detection of food pathogens. We have a, uh, a food science institute on campus, so we ask them to co-sponsor. We have a uh, Department of Human Nutrition on campus, we ask them to co-sponsor. And we're, we're asking for $100, $200. Uh, and we also give them time with 
the person while they're on campus. We'll say you have from 10 to 11 o'clock to invite your faculty down for a coffee or whatever and visit with the distinguished lecturer. Um, and, and so it's, it's been pretty successful. Um, I, honestly, because of my travel schedule, I did not get to see Dr. Everett this past year um, on the climate, energy, water nexus. Uh, I heard good things about it, but uh, it's that and the Science Cafe, I think, are, are two programs that give us the maximum visibility uh, on campus and in the community. Um, the Science Cafe, um, the people who come are probably largely associated with the university, but because we have it at the coffee shop in the room we're at, a lot of times there's students that are studying, whatever, and they actually choose to stay and listen. Sometimes they get up and leave, but uh, a lot of times they'll stay and participate, so that's good. Um, we, uh, the distinguished lectures, we, we move them around campus a little bit, depending on what size lecture hall we think we're going to need. Uh, um, and uh, so I think that was my last slide. Yep. So. So my name is Dave McDowell. I'm from Georgia Tech. And so we were very pleased to receive the second place in Chapter of Excellence Award last night from uh, Sigma Xi. So thank you, Sigma Xi. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about our activities at Georgia Tech. Uh, I'm vice president. Uh, we have uh, a kind of a rotating uh, leadership model where you're vice president for two years, then president for two years, then you organize what I'll discuss as the Money First Symposium for two years. So it's a long-term commitment. When you agree to leader leadership, you're in there in that role for quite some time. Uh, so I've been at Georgia Tech for 37 years. I've been a member of Sigma Xi for 35 years. <laughs> and I recall being involved in the leadership back in the 1980s. So, I, you know, the wavelength is pretty long for the, for the uh, recycling as well. And we, we're always trying to involve uh, uh, new people as well. Our chapter has 250 active members comprised uh, roughly of 50% faculty, 30% students, and 20% postdocs. Uh, we, we have taken a strategy the past few years of getting uh, more of the uh, new faculty, the young faculty, and uh, postdocs and graduate students involved uh, with a policy. If they win one of our internal awards, uh, any of those populations, uh, we cover their Sigma Xi membership uh, for a year or two, uh, just to kind of get them off on the, on the right foot for uh, the discipline of paying member dues and becoming involved in the society. So we were founded in 1946, installed as a chapter in uh, 1953. Uh, we have uh, two kinds of awards. One, one award is, is internal, as I mentioned, uh, and it, it's pretty substantial. There's uh, several uh, best paper awards, best thesis, both master's and PhD, and, a, and an outstanding sustained faculty uh, research award. Uh, those have uh, cash associated with them as well as the Money First Award that's listed at the bottom. The Money First Award is our sort of featured activity. That's a national Sigma's High level award that we administer uh, through an endowment that was provided by Money A First, the namesake, uh, many years ago in the 1930s and 1940s. And uh, we, we cover the uh, Money First cash stipend and, and <coughs> all the arrangements to, uh, try out to bring in former students of the, of the first award winner, uh, hotel uh, costs, meals, et cetera. So that's, that's quite an involved activity. So our, our, our sphere of organization really revolves around those two uh, activities and they're, and they're quite uh, uh, well oiled and time consuming, I would say. So this is the, the, the list of uh, current leaders so Paul Cole was uh, president before Zhuman Zhang, and he's the organizer for two years of the Money First Award. So here are uh, faculty awards, sustained research award, uh, best paper award, young faculty award. And then we give a number of best PhD thesis awards, best MS thesis awards, and best undergraduate awards. Of course, Georgia Tech is a big place. Uh, you know, we, we've got uh, a very large engineering school like Penn State and Texas A&M, significant in sciences as well. Uh, and so uh, these are really cut across uh, a, a wide swath of, of disciplines. And they're substantial. With, with this entire award program, the total cash awards is on the order of $30,000 a year. So it's, it's substantial through that money first. 
this uh, Yunin Zha was uh, the winner of the Sustained Research Award. He's a, a chemist, does uh, in situ uh, transmission electron microscopy of nanoparticles and quantum structures. Uh, so here he's shown giving, giving our lecture. We have two award ceremonies. One is our own for the student awards, and then the Georgia Tech you know, general award ceremony in mid-April is where the sustained research award is, is uh, presented, along with a number of other institute awards. So, you know, Sigma Xi is featured as a substantial component of the annual, you know, president's level uh, award ceremony each year. And the, and the uh, faculty and student awards are, uh, nominations are entertained in early January through the president's office, you know, with our input in terms of the verbiage and, and we form committees of faculty, uh, different committees of faculty for every award every year. So again, that's a, a major activity. So Bunny First was an interesting fellow. Uh, you know, he, he was a, a student at Georgia Tech back in the days when it was a, a very technology-oriented university, very male-oriented university. The first female PhD was like 1950s at Georgia Tech, something like this. Uh, but he had the foresight to do two things. One was to establish the Georgia Tech Research Institute, which is like our Lincoln Labs. You know, they, they do about six or seven hundred million a year in research, and the academic side does about five hundred million, so they're actually bigger than the academic side. But he, he had this uh, foreshadow of an idea that, that faculty should be doing research to be better teachers, right? So the interesting thing about the, the Money First Award is that it was framed to honor teaching in its broadest sense. Teaching, not only classroom teaching, but teaching through uh, research mentoring of students. So the award is given for lifelong contributions and impact on mentoring. Very interesting. And as a result, the award uh, ceremony, it's a day-long symposium, we had one last Friday, is organized by the former students of the award winner, selected by a committee from Georgia Tech and regional input. and. Uh, the students give the presentations, then at the end of the day, a one-hour presentation from the award winner looking back on, on his or her impact on the students, right? And specific scientific advancements and how it linked to the work of each one of them. Very, it's, it's just a fascinating uh, kind of uh, uh, symposium that you rarely see anywhere else. And then we have a banquet where we ha have them, you know, show their old movies of their lab mates and, and you know, how things have evolved over time. And they share a lot of anecdotes, and we just sort of are along for the ride on that. Dur during the symposium, you know, we have it in a pretty big hall, and I would say it's probably 60% uh, Georgia Tech and other local university attended, and then the rest are the award winners, students, and, and some of their families. So last year's winner was uh, Carol, Carol Ferke from uh, Texas A&M. Some of you may know her. She's in chemistry, does work in... Uh, metal enzymes and RNA catalysts. And so, uh, you know, this is from the Sigma Xi website. What better way to celebrate a science teacher than a day-long symposium featuring the accomplishments of her past students, right? And here are the speakers from former students and in some cases people that were just impacted along the road uh, by working with Carol. Uh, Julia Kubinek, for example, who's at Georgia Tech. kind of shows you the, uh, the frontal projection. We have side screens as well. This year's winner, winner is uh, Nicholas Pappas, who uh, had his symposium last Friday, as I mentioned, banquet Friday night. Uh, and he does work in, in biomaterials, uh, a real pioneer in the, in the whole area of biomaterials. So we're really pleased to be able to offer this significant uh, national level award on behalf of Sigma Xi. Uh, and the nominations are announced in, in April. Sigma Xi announces those, and then we convene selection committee uh, and perform the selection sometime in a midsummer time frame and notify the or early summer time frame. Notify the the students who nominated, and then they uh, congeal the organization effort, working with us to sort of schedule and make the detailed arrangements. Thanks.
from SUNY Plattsburgh, and uh, I'm giving this presentation in, uh, I don't know, in, I'm, I'm doing it for Nancy Elwes. So I'm not Nancy Elwes. And first thing I want to say is thank you, Sigma Xi, for the, the money, the grant money that helped us do this program. And uh, once again, I'll have contact information at the end. Nancy wasn't able to come. Uh, she had some personal business to have to take care of, and uh, she'd be happy to hear from you guys if you have any questions. So bear with me. So uh, this program was put together with grant money from Sigma Xi, uh, SUNY Plattsburgh, and from New York State as well. But this is an outreach program for master science teachers. Uh, we were supposed to do one workshop, and we ended up doing two. Each workshop uh, contained 12 master teachers and we bought portable uh, technology for DNA sequencing uh, and analysis that we could use in the field. So we'll show some pictures of that uh, technology. And the laboratory that we use is uh, the Adirondack Park. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but we'll have some information on that in a second. All right, so New York State has this program called the Master Science Teacher Program. And it's a very highly regarded uh, program with regard to increasing science education, also uh, skills-based with regard to current science teachers. So uh, it's very competitive to, to get into the program. You have to apply a uh, statement of purpose, uh, recommendations. You have to have high scores on the New York State content area. Uh, exam. Uh, you also have to have a minimum of four years experience as a teacher in your content, content area. So there are very uh, interesting uh, and, and stringent requirements for this program uh, to be uh, accepted into it. So these students also have to uh, take a number of workshops to have this designation. So there are a number of uh, things that they have to do to get this designation. And this workshop uh, was one of the things that they could select. Currently in New York State, there are about 900 master teachers. Uh, after you've been a master teacher, the, the master teacher um, uh, program is a four-year uh, program. And after you do your four years as a master teacher, and, and what you're going to do is you're going to learn, and then you're going to teach others, and you're going to do outreach. So uh, Nancy and, and our lab will be um, uh, responsible for additional trainings um, and, and being there for, you know, backup information and that sort of thing. So we're giving cutting edge, hands-on experience so teachers can bring this stuff back to their, their classrooms to do um, better education in the laboratory. So that's basically the idea. Uh, what else did I want to tell you? I think that's good. Uh, so the laboratory for this uh, workshop um, was the Adirondack State Park in New York State, and I'll show you a picture of where it's located. But basically, uh, it's a wonderful place to go visit. I, I invite you all to come. It's a great place to do research, if you do any kind of research um, uh, that's you know ecologically minded or whatever. But it's a 6.1 million uh, acre park. Um, there are more seasonal residents that live in the park than the year-rounders, all right, so almost double. Uh, our seasonal re residents. It's a park that's huge. I'll give you the dimensions in a minute so you can kind of digest that. But it, it's, it's a huge uh, parcel, and it's got about 52% private land. So the state and the private sector own the land together. And one of the most exciting things about this uh, park is that New York State, a number of years ago, uh, put a moratorium on uh, logging and came up with this program called Forever Wild. So the Forever Wild initiative um, prevented logging. So now New York State in the state owned uh, property has old growth forests. We have different types of wetlands, different types, um, bogs, all sorts of things that uh, you might not have in other areas. So it's, it's a interesting thing. Uh, there's a lot of political things that go on in the state, uh, in the park with regard to um, owner's rights. People want to build a house of a certain height, and there's a Adirondack Park Agency, and there's lots of political things that go on in the state, but um, it's, it's great. Uh, there are 42 peaks uh, that are over 4,000 feet. There's 3,000 ponds and lakes in the park. There's 30,000 miles worth of 
uh, streams, brooks, and rivers in the park. Um, Mount Marcy, the largest or the highest peak in New York State, is located in the High Peaks region. Uh, Lake Placid, if you've ever heard of Lake Placid, is in the, is in the High Peaks area. So um, there's lots to do, lots. Bring your money. We, we like tourism you know, and science. So here's where we're at. So Plattsburgh, New York, where I'm from, and the university is just outside of the blue line. That's the, the six, $6.1 million acre area is here in uh, the blue line. And if you look at this, this is how big it is. So think of Yellowstone, Yosemite, Grand Canyon, Glacier National Park, Smoky Mountains, and all of those all together is still smaller than our park. So it's, it's a rather unique area. And then for, for those of you who are not from the Northeast, don't know where Buffalo is, it's on that side. And then here's New York City, because everybody thinks Buffalo is where we are. Where, where would Rochester be? Rochester is over here by Buffalo. Oh, okay. Right around there. Okay. So here's what we did with the money. So we have these 14 uh, teachers, master science teachers, and we said to them, okay, this is your, your goal. All right, in 24 hours, you're gonna go collect samples, and then you're going to bring those samples to uh, get analyzed, you're gonna sequence it, isolate, you're gonna do all this in two days. So 24 hours is all you got. So anybody in here do DNA analysis? Can you do it in 24 hours? With students? You mail it off. That's even better. <laughs> then you can do it. Then you can get a refreshment. <laughs> but anyhow, so that was their, their goal. All right, so these were kind of, you know, these are teachers. These are science teachers. They know their way around a pipe header. Maybe, maybe some don't, okay? So all different kind of skill levels. The other thing with regard to the master science teacher is your recommendations. You, you, know, you have four years of experience teaching in the classroom. So you're good, okay, but you have to be good. So that's one of the, the criteria, okay? So, uh, and the other thing, the reason why this was done is that n very few organisms have been barcoded in the Adirondack Park, so this is another thing that's pretty cool with regard to this project. Oop. There we go. All right, so here's some of the equipment that we bought with the, the grant money that Sigma Xi has provided for us. Um, this little guy here, the separator, is about the size of a softball. Pretty little, right? All of this equipment, all of this equipment fits in a backpack, so you could walk into the field with it. And then the consumables that you have are in something like an ice chest size bag. I'm trying to look for a bag. Uh, you know what ice, ice chest looks like. So this little guy, the sequencer, is like, I don't know, maybe this long. You'll see another picture coming up that it's, you could see it in relation to a keyboard. Okay, so all of this equipment um, is all you need. So. Here we go. Also, the equipment was also in outer space. So they took stuff like this to the, uh, the space station. It went to the rainforest in Costa Rica, and it went to the Arctic, and it didn't work real well in the Arctic. So um, this is good stuff, good equipment. So we appreciate the funding. So thank you very much. Um, sorry for all the behinds. Uh, these are the teachers. So these are the teachers uh, collecting their samples. Uh, what we did is we live about 45 minutes from Lake Placid, Saranac Lake, uh, that area. So uh, we were in that area, High Peaks area. Um, they were able to collect their samples. And remember, they have the goal, 24 hours, collect your samples, uh, isolate it, sequence it, and analyze it, okay? So we did this, drove out there, collected our samples, and then in the field, what we did was we had all this equipment with us. So here's that, here it is, here's that unit. Look how little it is, that's, that's great, okay? And then here's the ice chest size box that we have. You have to have a laptop, and then here's a solar panel, and then here's a goal zero. I don't know if you guys know goal zero, that's great. Um, it's great for backpacking or whatever. You could uh, charge up a battery with solar panels. So all this stuff was packed away, either in a backpack and this, this, this chest, okay? So we did all the collection, and we did all the analysis uh, or separation uh, in the, in the uh, field. Um, right here, I don't know if we could see it. Um, we had a hard drive also attached, so any of the data, remember we had 14 uh, people, students, you know, master teachers doing their, their work. So what we did was downloaded the, the um, data to a hard drive so we would have it. 
So they did all this. And the thing that's cool is this is all um, real time. So we load up the sample. Here, we're loading it and we're sequencing, and you can see this live feed. So, and I wish we would have had one more uh, panel. We should have had an extra uh, photo on there. But you can see it, it's starting to do the base pairs for you, and they pop up on the, on the next screen. And it's like, you're watching it. It's like, holy shit, look at that. That's, <laughs> that's <laughs> really happening. It's <laughs> cool. It's you know? yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. And we get then, your excitement. <laughs> yeah. So DNA analysis was done in the computer lab the next day. So once again, they did their separations. We, we collected the data. Um, we packed up all our stuff, hiked back out to the cars, drove back home. All right, see you tomorrow. And then in the lab the next day, in the computer lab, they analyzed their their data and uh, so data analysis. They're doing like blast searches, or what do they do? How, what is DNA analysis? Entail? Don't ask me. I'm a chemist. Oh, okay. Organic chemist. I don't do that. Right. I'm not Nancy Ellis. <laughs> <laughs> you can ask her. You can ask her. So initially, what Nancy was going to do and her team was we were going to do one workshop. Okay, so after those 14 students, you know, those master teachers came in, they were like, oh my God, this is so great. I can't believe I learned so much. I learned all this great stuff. Um, you got to do more of these, because they were on the phone that night or the next day after 24 hours of working. They were like, oh my God, you got to do this. This is so good. They're telling their friends in the, in the master uh, teacher program. So we ended up doing an extra workshop. So we did a total of 28 uh, master teachers, uh, and guess what? This summer she'll be doing another cadre of probably 14, okay? Uh, other things, so here's what happened. Everybody got what they needed to do. So they isolated their DNA, they were able to get their sequences. Um, those sequences were added to the NCBI uh, database, so that's so cool, all right? We're doing stuff for the Adirondacks. And then they were able to successfully fulfill the challenge. So cool. that was great. They did it within 24 hours. And these are newbies, you know, pretty newbies, all right, learning the whole thing. Results, OK? So they were given an assessment, all right? So workshop assessment, we always do those. Um, you know, the typical questions, all right? Um, the quality of the workshop, knowledge that you gain, blah, 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 all that stuff. Would you recommend this workshop uh, to a colleague or friend? And a lot of them were like, yeah, I already did, that kind of thing. So um, we didn't get anything other than a five. Five was the top value, five is what we got. So it was fabulous, made us feel good. But we still always want, you know, you always want somebody to tell you, could you do this a little different? But all fives, all right? So the first workshop, so here's some bloopers or, or things that didn't go so well maybe, I don't know. So uh, one, one, you know, everything was happening. It happens fast, you know. You put the sample in and it's like, doo -doo 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 -doo. it's doing its thing and, and you're getting data, it's coming up quick. And then this one person's data, you know, sequencing was happening and then it's like, whoa, this is taking a lot longer. But it, it's still a spider or, or whatever, you know. It, it wasn't some big thing that should have a lot of DNA and wow, something's wrong. So, you know, we had to stop the sample, okay, stopped it, and then we asked some questions and uh, the person was doing their own DNA. They mm. didn't wear gloves. So when they, they did their sample, so they were doing themselves. They were doing human DNA, so that's gonna take a little bit longer, all right? Then we had out in the woods. We didn't wanna stay out there when it was nighttime. Uh, also, you know, the typical outdoor things. You're out in the woods, so you have mosquitoes, chiggers, all kinds of bugs, you name a bug. And then, you know, we gave them pictures of poison ivy. Don't touch this. <laughs> we had one person get itchy, so, you know, that happened. Um, so what do we want to do? So in the spring semester, so next semester, Nancy has a uh, 12 student bioinformatics class that she's going to use this technology on. So they're going to be using this. 
Um, also, uh, the, the government of Ecuador has sent some samples, because I don't know about you guys, but in Plattsburgh, where we live, you, we're 20 miles from the Canadian border. We got eight inches of snow just the other day, so you guys can relate. You have snow here on the ground. Uh, we're not going to do any sampling in, in the wintertime, so uh, Ecuador was very kind to send some samples, so they're going to do that next semester, and, um, you know, pretty neat. and. Uh, just an amazing project. The, the, the students, uh, master teachers, were very happy. They're so excited to be able to try and bring this technology to their, their classrooms as well. Um, that's it. That's Wait a minute. Nancy Ellis is, where is it? I got to have her uh, info on there. Uh, all right, I'll have to get you that. So uh, Nancy Ellis, once again, was the researcher, uh, and uh, if you guys, I guess you guys can look her up. It's first SUNY Plattsburgh. It is. Uh, well, come on, come on, baby. Okay, here's her. So you can look her up. I think it's E L W E S S N L at SUNY Plattsburgh. But let me just yes. let me just look. Is it? You, you looked it up? You got it? At plattsburgh.edu? Yes. I'll, I'll have to email her. I'll have to get my glasses on. So, uh, but any questions, just ask Nancy. Not this Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I can give it to you. Anybody wants it? Here's her email address. It's E L W E S S N L at Plattsburgh, P L A T T S B U R G H dot edu. Okay, so E L W E S S N L. Thank you. Oh, I, I had a question uh, too. About the, the, the Georgia Tech uh, award budget was extremely large. Yeah. I think you said it was over thirty thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, uh, was there some endowments? Yeah, 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 yeah. We have an endowment. The, the Atlanta First uh, Foundation helps with that, right? And then we have some allocation every year to cover it as well internally. Was the endowment accumulated by the Quest gifts? Uh, from Money First, the, the First Foundation. Yeah, yeah. First Foundation. Yeah. So we have a first drive around Georgia Tech. We've got a first a lot of things. F E R S T. <laughs> yeah. I mean, every, you know, common at universities to have benefactors, and he's fortunately one that's benefited this particular, you know. Well, with that level of expenditure, I would estimate that your endowment is over a million dollars. Uh, no, because we have additional appropriations from the university as well. Oh, the university helps out. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's part of the awards, uh, the overall awards program. I see. Yeah. So, um, what percentage of the thirty thousand is uh, provided by the university? I don't recall. I don't. I don't have those numbers. Yeah, just to comment with regard to something like that, uh, we found out uh, I'm at Columbia University again, uh, Jim Kirby. Uh, for years, we've had um, the um, distinguished lecture series uh, speaker come in. It's been a long time. I can't think of year we haven't. I think we're over 20 years. Okay. So, um, but we also have been the last six years, I think now, coupled it with our student research symposium. So the student research symposium happens and the speaker, and then we give our awards right after that to the two students that win. We don't give thirty thousand dollars, no, but we do give like about five hundred dollars to an undergraduate and five hundred dollars to a graduate student presentation. So, I mean, you can, whatever you have, make it your award. That's, that's, they're, they're just as happy to get a certificate, oh, for sure. even frankly, whether you have any money to go with it or not. Yeah. Uh, the key is just making sure that students are recognized that they have the opportunity to do something like this that works so well. We've only had about 40 or 50 students in any given year that have presented. 
It's just the trouble for us is when, because most students don't really finish their research until in that last semester of their senior year. And in many of the programs, they're not really done until the end of the semester. You can't do it after the end of the semester. You can't you know, put it all in during finals and no one being there after it. So we, we're kind of stuck in the next to the last week of classes every year that we do it, but we still get some, some departments that don't even participate because, oh, our students aren't ready. They aren't ready. Well, next week's the last week of class. How can they, if they have to do a few for next week, can't they finish it one week early? <laughs> I would say one of the nice things about these student awards in particular is that uh, the individual academic units in sciences and engineering have to form their own committees and their faculty to put forward their top candidates. And so they, they have their internal deliberations on the Sigma Xi Best Thesis Awards, which is really kind of interesting, you know, and they, each of those are allowed to put in, I think, two candidates, and so, you know, you, you get all the units contributing, and then there's a, there's committees that evaluate those in the end. So, yeah. I, I guess then the money makes it more more interest vested interest in collective, you know, enterprise like that. So. Mm -hmm. I would just say one more thing about the distinguished lecturer series. Mm -hmm. I have contacted some of these people on that list and say, hey, if you're in the D.C. area, give me a holler. And they may do it gratis for you, without a without a you know a stipend or anything if they're already in your area. None of them will happen to just be in Manhattan, <laughs> Kansas. <laughs> We're 10 miles off of Interstate 70. You got to want to go to Manhattan. <laughs> Coffee house. They have a they have a room in the back that we use. Okay, I was going to say it's a separate room. Mm -hmm. in, at this particular coffee house, they have one. We have lots of coffee houses in Manhattan. Do they charge you any extra for that separate room? No, That's no. But most of the people who come will buy coffee. Some of them will have dinner. They do serve food there, so they're, they're making money. Because otherwise, they've got students sitting back there who, at four o'clock in the afternoon, bought one cup of coffee, and they're still sitting there taking up table space at eight o'clock at night. So they're happy to have us there buying coffee and and and, and soup or a sandwich or whatever. Yeah. Also true for the beer people. Do they have their own room on that? Yes. Yeah. This particular restaurant has a room has a a, a room that we use. Um, and we have full weight staff, and I would say probably 75% of the people who come order dinner, pretty much 100% of the people have beverage. Mostly yeah. beer since it's a tap house, but uh, yeah, and we don't get charged for it. We're in the back of an art gallery. Like a teeny tiny, I mean, it's probably the size of this room, little art gallery in the front, and then maybe half the size of this room in the back. And they're just happy to sponsor us. Um, There's a coffee place. No, this no, is this is just an, literally just an art gallery. No, it's we do hors d'oeuvres. We do hors d'oeuvres and a bottle of water because we're in the middle of the Bible Belt and we don't. You're not allowed <laughs> to sponsor drinks there. Um, my little heathen Texan self came there and it was not good. Um, so yeah, we uh, we did have ours in a restaurant. We had like a little conference or um, not conference room, banquet room, and. We could either you know, we buy some hors d'oeuvres, Sigma Xi would, um, and then if you wanted um, any kind of drinks, you could buy them yourselves. But look, uh, recently, the past year and a half, I guess, the little art gallery has decided they want to sponsor our um, science cafes. And so we have outside sponsorships for the hors d'oeuvres, so we're really not out a whole lot for that, just depending on who the speaker is. And different organizations will come in with us, and we still get to host them and say that there are science cafes, but they help pay for the hors d'oeuvres, tea and water, or whatever else, and we don't pay for the space. So I'll just say, we, one of, it's not even an officer, but one of our, our chapter members is the organizer. She goes out and finds the speakers. Um, we, 
we put it up on our website. We, we have a mailing list. Every, every person that comes to the cafe, we try and capture their email and they get added to the list for future cafes. And then we have a daily campus-wide newsletter and the day before or the day of, we put it in the, the campus newsletter. And uh, that, that has really helped a lot. I, I would say in the last uh, two or three years, our average attendance is, I it said it's never more, probably more than 30, but for sometimes we only had five. But so it's, it's gotten way better in, in the last year or so. We've got mixed results with our science on tap in, in terms of location. You know, the, uh, most of the time we said this organic farm, you know, they have a great facility when it's good weather. And very, you know, there's a big multiple the kids can climb on, so it works great. Uh, it wasn't suitable for cold weather. And so we've gone to a pub downtown and the acoustics were terrible. You know, uh, and anybody talk? Anybody carry on? Yeah, the regular bar noise was still there. Uh, line of sight wasn't good. Yeah, was there were only a few seats that were really saw it well. But now, rising silo, the organic farm, have put in some clear plastic partitions on the outside and some here. So we're hoping we'll be able to use that for, for, for the winter. But you do have to sound out the place, mm -hmm. you know, these other considerations. Okay. Yeah, following up on the brown bag lunch uh, series, uh, if you're at a university, take advantage of the faculty, especially the new faculty. We do six to eight seminars a semester, what? in a year, yeah. not a semester, a year, and uh, usually three or four each semester, and most of them are by faculty who will gladly give a talk. And None of our talk, except for our distinguished lecturer, we bring in a pay. That's what we. That's how we are as well. Yeah. yeah. The only expense we have, well, actually, we do have university. The university gives a certain amount of a budget. The only thing we spend money on is to have some, you know, cookies and fruit mm -hmm. and drinks out there for people to have when they come. But we would, if we didn't have that, we'd still have the series. Mm -hmm. It's so. It's. When you asked me to talk about it, I was like, well, we bring our lunch and we sit down yeah. and we talk science, you know, like, that's what we do. But it, yeah, it is fantastic because we're, we're the exact same way. I mean, other than a pizza recruitment in the beginning and a celebratory for the awards for pizza because grad students and like pizza. And students come off of them all this mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, the only expense we've ever had is for a couple of years, and I'm not even sure how it was funded. We, we had special uh, science cafe t-shirts printed up. And anybody who showed up, you, you put your name in a hat, we drew, and you got a t-shirt to go home with, so. I do want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, and there is pizza still out there, but they will take away if we don't <laughs> take advantage of that. But we have to put Yeah, I think it's 40 pizza for 4,000. Mm -hmm. That's 42, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah.